we can't see you on the camera, but there you go. <laughs> That's what Hello, it's all about. Today we are talking about the Internet of Things, and I'm happy to have a live crew here. Uh, Red, how are you? Hey, how are you guys? Atticus White. White. Hey, everybody. And Zach exactly. Dunn. Hey. And on the feed is also Patrick Jess. Hey, guys. So we're here today to talk about something that isn't a uh, normal topic for Angular, uh, the Internet of Things, physical devices, um, but it's something that the guys here at Robin have used before in the past, and also uh, it's just an interesting topic to talk about in general, even outside of Angular. So uh, why don't we start off with an introduction from you guys of kind of your background, and then we'll get into a little bit about what Robin does. So Atticus, why don't you start off? Sure. Um, I'm Atticus. I am a front-end engineer here at Robin, and I spend most of my days doing Angular and React development for the web dashboard and some of our mobile clients. Um, and we at Robin have a lot of Internet of Things integrations with beacons and such, so yeah. And Zach. So uh, my name is Zach Dunn. I run product here at Robin, which is basically a way for me to hide among the engineers uh, on, on a good day. Um, the majority of what we do here today is help businesses uh, that traditionally technology to them is like a new fax machine uh, figure out how to actually take the stuff like iPads and things like that and bring it into uh, the workplace uh, today, the easiest way to do that for them is with our primary scheduling tool, which is basically a way for people to put iPads outside of rooms and uh, mobile apps and get an instant feed on where physically everyone is in the office and what the room schedules are and things like that. Uh, generally, it's used by companies that are uh, beyond the point where they can name every single employee and conference room that they have and need to wrangle it, often across multiple locations. So I think it's interesting that the Internet of Things is like this buzz term that has been around for a while, right? It kind of a couple of years, and for a while it was actually pretty hot. A lot of startups doing Internet of Things, and everybody thought that was cool. But I think it's sort of over that initial curve now, and, and people are trying to figure out how to actually make money off of doing uh, these integrated devices. So can you talk a little bit about your history and like uh, how you actually got into this field and was it just a straight path or did you kind of like do a couple things before you figured out? So we'll focus on the beacon thing. Mm -hmm. Sure. So uh, we actually, believe it or not, started in the music festival space, which is a weird place for anyone to, I think, start if you've ever been to one of those. Uh, running the tech for that is actually ten times more challenging. Um, so where we would originally begin, actually, was we had a client service company called One Mighty Roar. And uh, through some weird series of events, the thing that we fell into was uh, like nightlife brands and music festival uh, presence of those nightlife brands. And uh, music festivals in particular, they would use RFID, like uh, little bracelets like this, uh, as the tickets. And if you are running like a, a music festival, it was a no-brainer to do this because like the counterfeit rate would drop something like 95% if you use RFID versus like paper tickets. And uh, so there, there were a lot of companies in the ticketing space, but then you would have this interesting scenario where everyone in the venue would be wearing an RFID tag that had no point once you got in the front gate. So our first endeavor into that was actually we built a system which could pick up these RFID tags and then start adjusting parts of the uh, surrounding environment to whatever uh, the person was physically. So you could do things like when people approached a booth, start changing the screens to uh, be more direct with them or say, hey, you and this other person are both in this room right now, you should meet. Um, and that was kind of like the first foray that we had into the idea that like, hey, stuff that happens like in the real world can actually like have a feedback loop uh, in real time, which is I guess the more important part of that, with uh, 
kind of digital component of that. It wasn't like, hey, give us your email, and then once you go home, we'll send you an e with like a, a newsletter with this. It's, hey, you're physically there. Let's let's make stuff happen as you're still there. Um, so we did that for a couple of years. Uh, got, I think we were some of the biggest appearances that we did for that were like the Budweiser Made in America tour, where people would take like photos and it would instantly upload to their Facebook. And then um, we also did like uh, Essence Music Festival, which is they would take over the Superdome and everything would go from there. But um, after a while, we realized that like most of the problems that we were dealing with were like basically boiling down to math problems. If you have a hundred unknown people coming in this entrance 20 minutes from now, how can you get them all like registered and into a system like this in under 30 seconds so you don't create a bottleneck? And uh, so we started to get a lot more requests towards more permanent installations, and the office generally was a, a good place for what happens when you know where everyone is. And um, uh, turns out there are a lot of good answers to that question, as we've discovered. And the, the, we were able to, around that same time, switch from RFID to beacons, which you've probably seen in estimates. Uh, these are basically like tiny Bluetooth radios broadcast in a theoretically, I guess, like 50-yard radius, but good luck getting that in the real world. Um, and you can make apps that recognize when they're in the rough vicinity of that and basically get uh, indoor GPS, for lack of better words. So you can start to make applications actually take into account not just the city that you're in for something like weather, but actually, in our case, we actually open you to the when you open our web app, we will load the room that you're physically in in the browser uh, instead of, say, just the, the office, which kind of has a, a lot of really interesting implications. So, so is that something that was uh, the front end part of that, uh, Ruminator, was that React, or what uh, technology is involved here? Sure. So um, the front end, we are religiously uh, angular at the moment. Uh, and there's a, there's a big part of that with, like, uh, when, you're, when you're dealing with a lot of, like, external sensors, an interesting way to look about it is you basically have a DOM, for lack of better words, for, like, your office, your physical world, and you need a way of basically reaching in and asking those things. It's like, hey, uh, you know, is someone in this room right now? And, and things like that. And... Uh, Angular actually lends itself very well to that. Uh, although we do have to, for our some of our room displays, uh, use React, which I think Atticus is slowly learning to to love as well. You know, healthy. Yeah. Sure, sure. Maybe Atticus is going to tell us a little bit about uh, some of that. Like, what, what was the problem we ran into that you needed to use React? Yeah, yeah, so we So we were looking to deploy a bunch of tablets uh, throughout offices that act somewhat like a digital signage to a room that shows things like the status, you know, if there's a meeting going on, if it's invited. And we wanted to be able to build fast, and we wanted it to be a code base that a lot of our front end engineers could work on as well. So we first looked at a cross-platform technology accelerator. And we built that, but it didn't really scale well with the features we wanted to introduce. And we're evolving our product as, as we figure out customer needs. And it was hard to really refactor these critical paths in a nice way. And eventually, we started looking at React Native as it became more popular and well-known and further developed. And it seemed to really cover a lot of the scenarios that we were looking to improve upon. And it was a lot like. Angular in ways where you can build these components, these reusable directives or React components, as well as manage state in a nice way. Um, and that was something that we couldn't do with the previous stack. And we didn't want to go native because it was something we wanted to have more coverage of engineers to be able to work on. We have a lot of front end guys. And further down the road, we also wanted to be able to wirelessly update these devices. And that's not really something you can do with uh, native development. And that's when we discovered Code Push, which lets us deploy wirelessly to these devices rather than having to also introduce this problem to, the, to our customers where they have to go around and update. 
Uh, so React was a really good fit for us there. I haven't really explored Angular integrations like Iconic for uh, mobile development, but React worked really well for what we needed. I think you meant Ionic. Ionic. <laughs> yeah, I get those mixed up sometimes. That's all right. And then uh, what, what was some of your background? Because obviously Zach uh, started the company. Uh, were you there right from the beginning, or did you join um, part way through? Yeah, I came pretty early on in at Robin, and uh, we started working on the web dashboard, and that's where I spent most of my time working on Angular. Uh, so it wasn't until sometime in the past year that I shifted towards React, but most of uh, what I do here at Robin, and still today, is uh, Angular, working on the web application. Great. Uh, so I saw that uh, Ari just joined us. Ari Lerner. How's it going, Ari? Hey, guys. Sorry for... Uh... Sorry for being a little late. Um, just catching up with with uh, the doc, the uh, discussion up to this point. Yeah, no problem. You can jump in anytime you want. And and this is a good point to mention that if you have questions for either Zach or Atticus during the course of the show, you can tweet uh, at with the hashtag ngair n g a i r. Um, so getting back to Zach, some of the stuff that, that you talked about. Um, one one thing that I'm curious about with beacons, and I may be misremembering this, but I, I thought there was a time where like everybody thought that you could create these uh, app or these systems where like anybody walking into a store, like with their iPhone, you'd be able to like uh, detect who it was and like do some stuff off of it, and then there's like some security concerns around that and and whatnot. I, I don't remember the whole story there. What what was the deal with uh, that when it went down like uh, like a year or so ago? Yeah, so um, a large part of what we actually do, especially in like the B two B side of things, is um, trying to. It's not a matter of what you can build; it's more of like what people will actually adopt. Uh, so. Uh, one of the nice side effects of, of building kind of in the IoT kind of sphere, which really, like, as you said, is used, I think, a little too broadly. I mean, machine to machine has been around for, what, 20, 30 years at this point. And IoT is basically, and, you know, that, but not in cornfields anymore now. It's uh, white collar instead of blue collar. Um, so uh, when you're building when you're building like a web application, there's this sort of uh, unspoken thing where, okay, the web application is completely on my computer, I own my computer, I am aware of, you know, when the little light is on on it, so I know that the video is watching me, I know that, you know, the microphone's hearing me, and um, the, when you, when you take that and you move it to a bunch of disparate devices that are kind of in the area, like beacons or motion sensors, like, uh, you run into a lot of these, rightfully so, privacy issues where uh, in a hurry people are like, wait, how does the room know that it's me? I haven't done anything yet. Uh, or uh, why why am I getting a, you know, to use the kind of the early days of GPS, like you would be freaked out if, you know, every time you walked by a Starbucks, the Starbucks sort of sent you an email, Right. Um, and if that was the way that you were introduced to GPS, you would probably hate GPS until someone points out to you, now you no longer have to print out reams of MapQuest directions. And then you're like, oh, this is actually great. So um, as with most things, I think the early days of kind of IoT introduction to folks was largely around advertising plays, particularly at these kind of, uh, you know, that you walk into Starbucks and you get coupons blasted on your phone. But... Um, when you take that out of a context and actually make it a tool for people, like, schedule, like for example, this is a motion sensor here in this conference room, and even if we were all uh, phoneless, which is the equivalent of saying even if we were all naked, right, uh, it would still be able to pick up and, uh, and book the room for us on the calendar. So you, it's, it's little things like that that you can sort of onboard people to thinking of like, hey, the room is aware of what's happening in it, and, and more importantly, you can ask it questions about its current status. And I think that you have honed in on um, 
the, the meeting, the booking room thing, but I, if I remember correctly, you were playing around with for a little while, other things like, you know, it would play your music, your favorite music and that type of thing. Yeah. Do you guys still do that, that type of thing, or is it so, really just focused on meetings? The, the meetings has been our, our foothold, uh, primarily. The, uh, no one in the business world really goes and says, you know what my business needs more of? Entry music, right? Uh, <laughs> That said, um, you know we we have found that uh, the underlying engine for what we do is one half calendar syncing, which basically, if you think about calendars, it's more or less like a script for your day. So you can actually build a lot of interactions knowing that. Um, and then the flip side of it is our presence engine, as we call it, right? And we have APIs for both of those. So we have seen people build things exactly like entry music, but that is not what we're trying to sign up enterprise uh, kind of plans for, uh, you know, licensing rights with Spotify and all that, right? But um, at the end of the day, a lot of like the fascinating API things that you can do with the present system, the idea of like, hey, what, who's in this room right now? Or hey, what's happening in this room right now? Um, you can do anything from that to, uh, you know, Slack messages to you name it, really. So has it been the type of thing with some companies where they are excited about it uh, because Internet of Things sounds cool, they, they like buy in and then they're like, okay, how am I actually going to use this? They, they don't actually, even though they could get value out of it, it just kind of like sits on the side. Like I, I've heard that with some, maybe not this particular niche, but other IoT based ventures, that was like a common thing that uh, you know, people just wouldn't use it at the end of the day once you kind of like try it out. Well, so we looked at that, that was actually a very real problem I think for a lot of folks that you know, jump, jump on early to any industry, right? And um, do, you, do any of you guys have hue lights, like the light bulbs that from Philips released them, they're basically a fully addressable kind of a RGB LED lights, right? So you can say, hey, change to red or whatever. And they're really cool. And uh, you can, in theory, every time that you come home, have them change color to like different mood settings and all of that. But, you know, that's not something that you want to be thinking about every day necessarily. You want lights on or off, and sure, maybe you can hook them up to blink when you get an email or something. But, like, that's more of a party trick than uh, a practical application. So um, I think where, where we've had to develop a lot of this stuff uh, early days was less flashy stuff, which is more for visitors that might show up for 20 minutes a day, and more for the idea that, OK, people are going to spend eight hours here a day, and they're going to lose interest in the sort of shock and awe of these sort of blinking lights. and. Uh, I mean, I say this sitting around a table which literally has a hydraulic lift in it uh, and its own API. So um, there, this this table literally, you can, it has a, a REST API that we, we could tell it to do things like, yeah, uh, e each of the seats has like a light under it that you can code to different organizations. So like if everyone's sitting around the table, it, you know, you can have color coded based on who's who. Um, and, and you'll notice that the lights are all off because that's just not like a practical application on a day-to-day -day basis. But it is an interesting sort of thought experiment. So what's some of the cool stuff that you guys have experimented with? So maybe I understand that your um, the beacon thing is the primary focus, but you must try other things out as you are kind of like playing around with some of these devices. But some of the cooler things that you guys are playing around with. So this kind of goes back to the thinking about like the physical world kind of as its own DOM, so to speak, right? So a lot of the interactions that we would build out were things like, uh, like I think we, we released like an Angular camera, right? Which basically just taps into whatever kind of webcam that the device has. 
and uh, you can record GIFs off of it and then send it back upstream and things like that. So you can get like an actual feed of all of the different uh, rooms in your, your office in sort of GIF form. Um, and then more importantly, like when you kind of jump to the IoT side, you have this benefit of being able to specify exactly the platform that you're running it on, right? A Chrome box is not that expensive in the business context. And Chrome OS, you can run a lot of those sort of things like, um, I think Bluetooth is actually now uh, accessible directly from the, for, for apps that run on it. And it's generally ahead of the curve too. So you could actually, uh, I think, sniff like the network uh, kind of SSID and things like that and start to pull in that kind of context for these apps. So um, the way that we currently think about it is if you have all of those devices and sensors pulling into um, a, a web service or something like that, how do you create uh, event loops for those? So for example, like on, instead of on click, it might be on physical entrance, right? Mm. Like what is the web, web app doing? Because I could walk into a room with my laptop open, right? And then if I'm suddenly present in the room or if the room suddenly like has a new calendar sort of invite on it. Like how 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 how's my browser responding to that in the Angular side? How's the room display responding? How's the notifications and things like that? So we build a lot of event bindings to things that aren't actually physically on the device. But so how how does that work? Are you guys using like push notifications down to the client? Like what what's the like little implementation there? Sure. So um, some of this is just. Uh, good old long polling, but uh, we do have a kind of node proxy which we're able to pipe down a lot of uh, events through like just socket connections and things like that. Um, we have played with uh, push notifications on that. Uh, it's a little more challenging as far as like web apps uh, at this point because a large part of our client base is corporate and they don't exactly have the latest Chrome or Canary builds running as much as I'd love that. So, Ari, it looks like you had a question. Did you want to ask yours? Yeah, I have a, uh, I have a couple, obviously. I don't, I won't, uh, because I've already talked about some of these, I apologize. Um, uh, do you have, like, a, a what does your tech stack look like? Do you have, um, is it homogenous or heterogeneous or is it dependent on the customer that you're using? Like, what, what powers... What powers your stack? You guys are muted, by the way. Do a few areas of our stack. We have a back end, which is where a lot of the raw brings are for gathering presence and calendar invites and all that. So we have a RESTful implementation on the back end. And then we have a number of client applications that are feeding from that. So we have the web dashboard, which is our Angular app. Um, and that also runs, as Zach had mentioned, a node back end that proxies a lot of the information from our RESTful API uh, down to the Angular app and kind of formats it and maps and reduces it in nice ways where we can get meaningful information out of that. Um, and then we have other applications around too, such as uh, the React application we were talking about earlier on the tablet devices. And we have a mobile app as well that uh, we're also looking at with React. But most of our stacks are Angular and React. And then on the server side, we have PHP, RESTful, API, and a lot of handful of Go microservices to handle these more IO and job related duties. So. If you think about all these devices on our stack where they are sending information out, uh, that's a lot for just a RESTful API to deal with. So we have some Go microservices that can offload a lot of that and properly process it and bring it back into the application when it's ready. So it sounds uh, like... So, yeah, that's, that's a good glimpse of our stack. Cool. So it sounds like you have... Um... It sounds like you guys have uh, are are working on kind of a lot of cool things, um, and also it sounds like your tech stack is can be seemingly it sounds complex from the outside of deployment. Like, do you have 
like uh, who with these with the services that you're building, who like who's the primary customer? Who do you who do you build these things for? Sorry. Sure. So um, I'll field this. So uh, primarily, we sell, sell to IT managers and companies that are over 50 people. Uh, some of the folks that run us today are organizations like Sonos, Netflix, uh, Instacart. We run basically all of their headquarters scheduling. Um, and then as they expand their sort of empires, they, we also uh, rope in those. Um, the Larger kind of deployments are, they use varying parts of this, like scheduling for some and others. They want kind of the raw occupancy analytics that we're able to provide, but um, it's a grab bag. So you're, uh, it sounds like you spend a lot of time working on scheduling. Is that, mm -hmm. that's kind of like where your sweet spot is? Yep. So, yep. That is the uh, that is the on ramp for most of these things. Uh, it is also somewhat of a Trojan horse because you actually get to uh, the schedule is like we said, kind of the, the script for the day, right? So you can actually build a lot of related applications on top of the idea of I know where everyone potentially is supposed to be uh, at a certain time of day. So uh, where do you see that going? Like, what, what, if you could forecast it out, take say a year. Like, what does that look like? What so does that enable? Sure. So, um, right now, like, if you are, this is, I think, the promise of IoT in general, right? Like, it is not necessarily one killer application where you're like, oh my god, the the soundtrack to Rocky plays every time that I kick down my front door. Um, but it's more the idea that, like, you don't have to physically be in a place to affect change in that place or to know what's happening in that place, right? So um, if you're sitting in a corner of your office, um, you know, should you be able to... Uh, preload uh, a conference room with your meeting notes, your presentation, your uh, calendar, and should you be able to treat that almost like a state that you could save on the room, and then if someone comes in and says, hey, uh, I need this room, can you move to another one? Wouldn't it be neat if you could just save the state of the room and unpack that in another room uh, you know, right next door that has all the same uh, attributes. So you can kind of think about it almost like, for lack of better words, Docker, but for physical rooms. And uh, that's what we spend a lot of time thinking about, uh, particularly when we're building these, these front ends that have to kind of normalize physical space. We have actually one good question on Twitter that I wanted to ask you guys. Maybe I can, uh, you can feel this one. Have you guys started looking at Angular 2? And if so, do you guys have any kind of thoughts of how you, you're going to migrate your Angular 1 stuff? Um, I unfortunately haven't looked too much at Angular 2. I, I, when it was first getting announced, I have watched a bunch of the lectures and talks on it. But uh, we had to take a quick turn into React for our mobile stuff. So I haven't personally been able to look too far into Angular 2. But um, based on how they've set up a lot of these component-based approaches and stuff, I really like those approaches. But I unfortunately haven't looked too far into Angular 2. We're running 1.4 on our main web application right now. And uh, with one. What, I believe 1.1.5 just dropped last week officially. Mm -hmm. So the component side of things, I think that, that brings us closer to the Angular 2 promised land, right? Uh, promised land. <laughs> so um, I don't know. See, we deal with a lot of, a lot of very kind of like directive-based stuff because you have to be able to drop in kind of the uh, almost dashboard approach of like, hey, you have 
literally like some companies will have a hundred iPads, right? And we have to represent those in the DOM in like a way that could actually like feed in things like ephemeral data is a big thing for us. So like battery level, right? Like you don't need to know battery level from like three months ago, right? But you might need to know the trailing hour. And you probably want to get some regular updates to that. So um, a lot of the kind of app structure that we kind of wrangle with and why I'm excited for Angular too is that it will make that sort of uh, component level stuff a lot easier. At least my, my understanding of it. Yeah, for sure there's the ability to structure code better. Um, I mean, one of the things that Atticus, you were talking about, uh, as far as the reasons for going to React Native, it sounded like to me uh, it was a combination of the code push thing and a performance thing. Um, so, and, and for sure React Native is further along than the other available options for that, but uh, there's, yeah, there's like native script that's coming out now with uh, that's working well with Angular 2 that you guys should take a look at. We're going to have them on the show in about a month. And also Ionic 2, they, they, they aren't as uh, performant maybe as uh, React Native and um, native script, but they have like the code push thing that actually there uh, is a new service that they are have available. So I uh, just wanted to mention that. <laughs> Anyway, um, so so what else, uh, Zach? For the stuff that you guys are working on, you do a lot of Node development, right? So, like, are there aspects uh, of uh, Node that made it a particular interest, like as opposed to actually you, you do Go as well? You, you mentioned. Yeah, on our so, front end side, we do a lot of, of Node though. Uh, okay. Go is mainly on the back side. So, uh, what's what's I guess the what do you use each for? What like uh, where do they fit naturally? Sure. Uh, on the node side, we use that more to uh, get the information out of the back end and provide that for our front end. So on the dashboard application or web application, uh, we use Node a lot to take you know presence from say across an entire office and map that down into relationships for each space and bring that back down to the client. So, and in general, I think JavaScript lends itself well, really well for the whole idea of Internet of Things, um, especially on the on the Node side. So if we have all these, and this isn't quite how our application is set up on, on the Node side, but when you have all these different devices sending out data, uh, Node's set up really well to take in a lot of event sources and then pipe that through streams, pipe that through transformers. So with all these, this data we're collecting from, say, devices and sensors, uh, Node works really well to take all these different sources, map them together from what is usually meaningless data until the application understands the purpose of each, each sensor. Uh, Node works great to transform that into actual events that you can broadcast. And Zach made a mention of uh, just like how you might have a click listener, you could have an on-person enter to room listener. And that's all familiar stuff that we all uh, work with with JavaScript, these listeners. So, yeah, Node works great in that regard. Right, so I'm curious with what some of the stuff you're saying. Have you looked into some of the reactive programming stuff that's becoming popular? It's been around for a while, but becoming like more popular uh, with like RxJS and that type of thing? Yeah, exactly. Uh, when you have all these different types of event sources that may represent a different reading from a sensor, say it's a light sensor or, or a motion sensor, and you want to, say, define certain behaviors that your application should go through depending on a scenario, uh, these reactive libraries work great for that. Because you, can, you might have five different sensors, and you want to combine them into when they meet a certain condition, it means this has happened in the physical world. So these reactive libraries were great for that. Uh, we see that in non-IoT related stuff all the time. And when IoT comes into the picture, it's really uh, just another event source that you might be used to somewhere else in a typical application. OK, and then for Go, what, uh, what do you mean? Uh, you did mention, but I don't remember. What, was, what were you using Go for? Uh, so we use Go for a lot of our more job-related processes. Um, and that's not a part of the app that I work on tremendously, but we do that a lot for 
emails that might go out when certain events happen, and these more job-related tasks that are in the result of something else. Or if we're syncing a bunch of calendars for the Robin platform, I will go with that. And I can see Go working great if you have all these different devices and you need to queue up these jobs to happen based on that. Uh, Go might work. To give you kind of like a sense of like some, how some of these sort of uh, you, you, your thinking changes a little bit when you have to factor in kind of like live sensor data. So you actually have things like where your event validation would include things like, uh, you know, is the room physically occupied right now? Right, and and that would actually have meaningful impact on like whether or not you could submit a form as is right, now. Um, or you know, you could easily expand that to things like sensor data. In, and there are other companies that are doing things, especially in like the wild world of like HVAC and climate control. Right, the idea of um, when when the room temperature is above a certain amount and this many people are in the office and you know, someone opens the front door, like you can start to tie together these events which are, you know, useless on their own and then start to kind of orchestrate and script out uh, a lot of roles that actually take place in the workday and, you know, fall to the office admin or things like that where it's not necessarily worth hiring someone for but someone's got to do it. So what about the future of IoT? So going even beyond what you guys are working on, just the general space, we talked a little bit about it earlier, but there was a huge hype, kind of started honing in a little bit, and do you think that it's due for another like kind of growth with maybe some technical advancements that are on the horizon? Like what, what's, what's the future that you guys see? Yeah, so what gets us excited, and I think what gets most people who are doing kind of like stuff in the IoT space excited are not is not necessarily like um, the idea of, oh, people are now understanding that the Internet of Things exists. It's the idea that it's easier to get data out of the real world and into applications. And the implication of that is that if you can quickly identify who uh, is involved and then the environment they're, they're in, you can actually make it a lot easier for people to interact with stuff. And I'll give you a good example. Like this is a um, this is a device called the Maya, which is actually, have you seen these before? These are, these are pretty cool. So basically they have, uh, yeah, have you played with them? They're amazing. Um, this is, a, I think, one of their earlier versions. But this is a perfect example of like, the sorts of devices which I look forward to building for instead of just keyboard and mouse. The idea is you wear this around your upper kind of arm like so, and there are metal contact plates um, on the inside that can detect your hand's current configuration. Now, kind of the cool part about that is that um, as you walk around, this can pair to nearby devices. And the implication is that if you imagine a future where this is as this sort of device is as common as, let's say, a cell phone, right? Um, then you can have people walk into areas, physical space, and then basically commandeer devices that are nearby them. And so you start to deal with this kind of interesting interaction where there is no keyboard, there is no mouse, there might be a screen, and the way that you have to look for events is through kind of literally gestures, right? And I think the Connect is probably a more accessible uh, version of that. But the idea of um, if you're going to have this many devices in different places, you're going to have to start building different interfaces for them and, and start doing things like motion capture or, you know, a little bit more than just swipe left or swipe right. And that's tricky, but that's where it gets cool. So um, uh, I've done a little bit of work in, in IoT, uh, just a little bit. Um, uh, obviously, it doesn't really compare to what you guys are doing. Um, but 
I am interested in it, and I, this is more. This is a question really for the kind of the viewers, and like if what would your suggestion be on uh, if I or a viewer um, wants to get started in doing something with um, with physical devices? Once, like, what? How would you suggest that um, someone start? So the if you haven't picked up an Arduino or like a, a a Raspberry Pi, which are basically, um, this is little tiny, tiny computers or microcontrollers. This is an example of like uh, a ra uh, an Arduino that has like a network board. And so basically these are the type of things that are like the modern day Lego Mindstorms, if you uh, remember that from probably, what, 10 years ago, where basically that would, it, it reached a point where you no longer needed that super smart friend uh, that you know majored in electronics to be able to put together like a, a little sensor that could send stuff uh, to the internet. So um, you can very easily and for like under forty dollars or thirty dollars, yeah. that's interesting. Um, make for example like a, a motion sensor uh, that literally feeds information back to whatever you built. So. If I was trying to get started in this, I would I would pick up an Arduino or a Raspberry Pi, which is a similar thing but a little bit more uh, kind of computery than just a, a microcontroller, um, and just like play with the sensor data. Uh, you, motion sensors and, and distance sensors and things like that. Just having that data available actually like kind of changes a lot of your thought process and how you build certain things. You mentioned. Uh some of the devices. What about Tesla? Yeah, so Tesla uh, is another really cool one. I don't have one on the table here, but um, basically you can write JavaScript, uh, which is probably even a better one. I would pick up a Tesla. You can write JavaScript, and it's basically uh, rather than trying to figure out which port number your temperature sensor is attached to, you can literally run, I believe, like uh, like an npm package install for your temperature sensor and it will you'll be able to tap into those feeds. So a Tesla too would probably be a similar thing. So speaking of Tesla and all these uh, IoT devices, um, what do you think of the IoT ecosystem? Right, because IoT is great when everything can talk to each other, but everyone keeps isolating it and saying like Google well not Google, but like Samsung's IoT and their ecosystem, then Philips IoT and like everyone's trying to get you to buy into their like ecosystem, which is kind of the opposite of what IoT is trying to do, and that is to say like everyone can talk to each other. Um, what do you think of some companies doing that? Of course, for like marketing, et cetera, reasons. And do you think everyone should just push for a better communication with each other, or what, what are your thoughts on on that? So like, there's a couple initiatives I think like all join is a big one. Uh, where a bunch of folks have basically come in and said, all right, if we're going to have these devices talk to each other and there's no intermediary web services, like how are we going to do this properly? Um, that's a little bit more low level, but there are kind of those initiatives. And then you have, I believe, what's the other one? Thread? I think Nest is backing that one. Um, and, uh, you know, those are all great. I think that generally where people, we will consolidate out over this eventually. However, uh, the best example for like where I think people are messing up is Samsung has been making smart refrigerators for let's say like the past five, seven years for the sake of argument. And um, one of those refrigerators, uh, I guess, has the ability to check your calendar, right? And has its own you can connect to that and all that. Great. Okay. Let's let's not debate the merits of that, I guess. But now they're starting to deal with for the first time like, hey maintenance on our devices requires more than just a, a guy with like a screwdriver, right? There's this idea that, hey, we, so there was, I think shared a few weeks ago uh, in some of the circles on the Google groups for Google Calendar was a bug report where a guy was basically like, hey, my, my refrigerator can no longer fetch my calendar. Samsung, please fix. And uh, they just can't. So you have this concept of like, people building these devices which can talk to things and are using kind of the proper web services, but the, the problem that they're hitting is not incompatibility, it's 
a lack of software maintenance. Oh, are you saying that like the API changed or something like that and they can't update the device? They, they just stopped supporting the firmware for it. Yeah, okay, got it. Or, yeah. you know, the, so you have these standards help, but like you're always going to be, unless you're dealing with literally just kind of one trick ponies where it's like get temperature data, send it using this following format, you're going to, the larger problem is how are you going to maintain the fact that your refrigerator now needs kind of regular patch updates when Google pushes new kind of web services. So, so this is this is pretty interesting because like um, like I guess we could go into um, was it Tesla, right? Like they solved this problem by just giving everyone three like like data plans essentially. And then they constantly update the car every single day essentially, like every other week or something. Um, so that's it's really interesting that um, in some parts of the IoT industry, like I guess you could say that Tesla is an IoT car in, in a way, because <laughs> you can get every single like data point for the car. So like, what's interesting is that you brought up a point that um, if these refrigerators are also connected or something like the toaster, um, should they also be connected to the internet? Should they provide their own internet, which is probably overkill? And um, what would that look like? And do you just interact with the phone? Is the phone the mediator? that connects, that wires everything up, and what do you think of that um, being like, uh, your, your thought of, of how everything should be connected? Well, so I kind of look at it like uh, there's two kind of mindsets uh, that people come into IoT with. One is that you are a hardware company and you use software as a way to make your hardware work, um, and that that is okay, but it also causes you to run into things like um, okay. What let's say let's say that um, by some miracle the Amazon or that Windows Phone suddenly becomes like an amazingly adopted product, right? And now all of a sudden uh, people want to buy that instead, and then do they have to actually pick their phone based on which apps are supported for their toaster that on iOS versus, like, Windows Phone? So, like, the <laughs> there are some interesting questions around that. I think that your ability to treat the, the hardware as a tool for your core software thing changes your philosophy on that a lot. Like, the... So I think what we'll start to see is a lot more kind of like headless devices that have to follow some sort of just spec for sending data upstream. But ultimately, like, the hardware companies that are doing this, like Samsung, they need to generally, like, figure out how they're going to do those uh, applications instead of just format the data on the device side. Actually, you say an interesting word there, too. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, spec. I, I feel like if we move in a direction where we're going to have, you know, less isolated systems and less isolated devices, and I don't know if anything like this exists currently in the IoT world, but the idea that there is more of a uniform spec on um, how to tell a device what to do and maybe the format in which a device sends what it observed. And I think once we introduce something more formal there, just like anything else on the web, you'll start to see a lot more of these integrations tied together. But otherwise, it's kind of a closed door where you don't know how to talk to your toaster. You don't know if it's even listening for you. But if there was more of a spec and all these devices respected that spec, you know, not only could you program and tie these together how you want to, but you know, these devices could probably observe what else is around and kind of on their own figure out how to talk to each other. So that's probably a good step in that direction if something like that moves forward. So what are your, what are your guys' thoughts? So you brought up a good point of like, does Toaster, is the Toaster aware, right? Like um, Google's starting an initiative with IoT movement and they, they mentioned this during I think Google I.O. or something or, or their, their Chrome like uh, conference, but they mentioned that the, the future of uh, of the web is actually IoT and its interaction through Bluetooth and the casual interactions. And then that's where 
uh, things are going where the toaster is going to emit a URL and then you could interact with it casually on your phone and then that's how they kind of get around the, the whole like barrier um, which is funny because like it's a whole like going in circles of like do you install this app and it's like no or this is where the web kind of like wins again uh, of the casual interaction thing um, so it's really interesting that they like they created like a like they're pushing they're pushing this movement of the the router now and that's like a way of consolidating all of like IoT stuff and their own like their own like IoT like standards built into the router uh, like their hub thing um, so it's it's pretty interesting that they're like I would say that's their Trojan horse in the IoT space to consolidate all the uh, standards uh, I think Ari probably has some uh, some comments on the hub I don't know <laughs> yeah <laughs> the hub um, perhaps it's appropriate for uh, another hour-long discussion. Um, I guess uh, trying to trying to get back um, before we have before we jump into like uh, our Twitter Q and A and and picks and kind of end the episode. Um, uh, I guess just just thinking about it from a perspective of not having having done this before and not ha like. Is, would do you have any suggestions for what um, how would you how do you think about like when you're when you're writing an application that give, connects yourself to hardware like how how do you think about applications such as like Facebook who are, are not don't have a direct connection to um, hardware like how does how do these like um, Internet solely, internet solely, uh, network-based applications interact like to interact with our um, physical devices to provide an, an enhanced experience. Or is there no connection? Well, I think that the Fitbit is actually a great example of this, right? So, like, it, it, does does anyone here have like a, a Fitbit or a Jawbone or anything? Maybe yeah. some, you used I'm to like have one. It's in a drawer somewhere, right? You know, you yeah. aspire to maybe wear it. I'll have so, a Withings watch right there. There you go. So um, I think, was it Withings that made the first thing that literally watches you sleep? It's like a little camera that you, like, sort of, it, like, figure, it, like, maps the plane that you're on, like, when you're sleeping, oh, and wow. then it, like, figures out if you're, like, moving or not. And then, I don't know. I, that's, like, a very bizarre story to tell. But... Um, <laughs> The future is here, guys. So, um, so like most of the kind of uh, kind of health and wellness apps, right? Like, uh, like the Fitbit, right? So the way that you look at that data is not, hey, here's step data or here's the uh, pulse data, right? That is more of like a a feed that exists in the context of you, right? So when I say, hey, Ari, like, how active is Ari? Um, maybe the answer to that question comes from Fitbit, maybe it comes from a number of other sources, but like, I think the, the interesting challenge that IoT has to solve is not necessarily to what Patrick, I think, was saying, like the, the standardized spec, although that is an important part, but like figuring out how to like group together the types of data that are useful when you're asking questions like, uh, you know, what is this car, you know, on or you know what what's the latest on this car or like how active is is Ari or you know is this room uh, in good shape right those are the questions where the answers will come from a bunch of different brand names and people aren't necessarily going to care uh, if it's a Fitbit or a Jawbone they just care that it's a step data. Cool. All right, we're right at the end of our time, so let's do one. Twitter question that is in the queue, and then we'll go right to picks. Uh, the Twitter question is, have you seen any use cases for implementing GraphDB-style technologies such as Neo or Titan with IoT? No, I am admittedly not familiar with either of those. OK. I, I mean, a lot of times the graph database are used for like mapping relationships, so that's probably what he's thinking about, is that uh, you know, there's probably some relation there to uh, figuring out, you know, what's the relationship of this to that. Yeah, I think there's probably always room for 
whatever is going to satisfy the challenge that you're facing. So like we were saying, these sensors stream in a lot of information. And you can have a lot of different sensors for different purposes. So if this is all going to one place, you know, and depending on if you need this historical context or if it's just the last five minute snapshot, and maybe you have 100 devices, each one reporting something a little bit uniquely different than the other, then you know, depending on what it is, something like that could certainly be helpful versus just, I don't know, a database that's unlike GraphQL. All right, cool. Let's go to picks. <clears throat> uh, Patrick, why don't you start off? Yeah, so my pick is tomorrow's episode, or no, Thursday's episode. <laughs> Thursday's episode of uh, Reactive Redux with uh, the creator of Redux himself, Victor, and um, oh man, what's his name? I can't believe I'm totally blanking on it. <laughs> well, where can we find that information? I, I, I don't know yeah. if you meant to, to be a joke or not. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, our, our pa fellow panelist, uh, Rob Warmald. I think you were trying it to... Was, it was a joke because he's, he's not on. <laughs> okay. Yeah. All right, uh, Ari. Uh, so I've, I've, uh, th this past weekend I went to Death Valley in California, which is the, um, features both the lowest point in the continental United States and the highest point in the continental United States. Um, and I went uh, dune boarding, dune sat, uh, dune sand boarding down the dunes there. It is so much fun. That place is so beautiful. I can't recommend it enough. Um, uh, more relevant to software, uh, if, you're, if you're looking at a, a new language to kind of pick up and learn and, you know, uh, just to kind of expand your breadth of languages, or if you've used it in the past, Swift is actually a really fantastic language. It's a type language and it's very um, it's similar you won't you won't feel like it's totally something completely different like a lisp uh, perfect.org I just found this a couple weeks ago perfect.org is a um, Swift backend uh, web server um, or framework for building backend web servers so you can uh, integrate your backend and your front end using one uh, code base it's pretty cool it's really neat that's cool. Uh, for me, <clears throat> I am just have one pick, sort of playing off Patrick's pick for our Thursday show of Redux. Uh, Lucas Rubolki, friend of the show, uh, also loves the whole reactive Redux movement and created a really good blog post earlier this week. So I'll include the link to that in the show notes. Uh, Add this. I got a couple picks. The first one is a framework to go along with IoT called Johnny5. And it's great for Arduino projects, where Arduino has its own uh, editor and language that you usually configure it on. But Johnny5 lets you develop your Arduino board using Node.js uh, with a very familiar looking toolkit. So Johnny5 is great for getting started. And my other pick, uh, disclaimer, don't do this, but it's called Skyjack, and it's a uh, one of those drone, uh, I think they're called parrots, and the guy put a Raspberry Pi on it that would scan for uh, fingerprints of other parrot drones, and it would fly to it, and it was able to take control of that drone, <laughs> and then fly away with it. <laughs> so a little bit of, you know, thoughtful fun, maybe not actually doing it. I can also attest Johnny5 is awesome. It's definitely a place where I would get started. All right, and Zach. Cool. So uh, my two uh, picks here are kind of similar theme. When you're getting into kind of the IoT side of things, figuring out where to get data from and where to put it is actually a Sounds like a simple problem, but it, you know, or an easy thing to solve, but less so than you think. So this is um, a site called Thingful, which is basically uh, a complete overview of, let's say, publicly available sensor data. So you can go anywhere in the entire world, 
you'll probably you'd be surprised how many sensors are actually publicly available in streaming data. So for example, you can see like weather station humidity. This one clearly is still in debug mode, but um, you can start to see physically where this data exists and start to pull that into projects because you know, wind speed sensors in Boston, for example, you're not going to get a huge variance if you own the device or if someone else does. So this is a great place for that. The other one is uh, for posting data somewhere. Uh, this is a ridiculously simple app, and I, I, I marvel at the elegance of it. Basically, it's like Twitter for devices called Duit.io. Um, I know, right? So the idea is basically, okay, you have a, you have a temperature sensor or whatever, from time to time, you just post a tweet, I guess as they call it, uh, which basically just logs the current value of the device name, and, and you can pull a feed of this. And in many cases for sensors, that's all you need. And it's it's free to get started, too. So it's a great way to avoid having to stand up a, a, an API just to play around with sensors. That's really cool, actually. <laughs> Definitely uh, use that. All right, cool. Thank you, Atticus. Thank you, Zach, for joining me. It's been a lot of fun. And we'll see everyone uh, again on Thursday to, for our show on Reactive Redux with Victor Savkin, uh, that guy from the panel that I don't remember his <laughs> name, and uh, Dan Abramoff. All right, guys. Have a good one. Bye. Cool. Thanks. Bye. See ya.